everyone for being here and making a little bit of time to discuss, uh, I would say, a, a relatively under-discussed topic, especially when it comes to Norway, which is community benefits and renewable energy projects and offshore wind. Uh, so let me let me see if this works well. Um, wish me luck here. Can you see my screen? Yes, because I have three monitors, so I never know what's going to happen when I press F5. Let's go and have a look. Yes, it's still working fine. So. As I was mentioning before, uh, I'm gonna talk today, 25 minutes, maybe a little bit less on community benefits and renewable energy projects. And I'm using sort of like a case study uh, offshore wind. And the idea that we all tend to have when it comes to offshore wind, at least most of us that are here, is that this is a promising activity. and We would like to have something looking a little bit like this. We want to have wind farms outside and powering, producing CO2 neutral energy that is gonna be used for further activity. And there's a lot of interest in the industry to develop this. And we see that this is uh, an area which is growing dramatically quick in the, in the last years. And it promises to be 1 trillion US dollars. I don't even know how many zeros there are, that is in the next 20, 30 years. So this is, is supposed to be the next big thing in the world. However, even though we have that, we have a lot of images like this. Uh, maybe this is not so much for offshore wind now, but this is a reality when it comes to wind craft or energy production by wind on land in Norway. People tend to have some degrees of resistance to renewable energy projects in particularly offshore or wind farms in general are part of the problem. And why does this happen? Well, renewable energy, particularly the ones that are being built now, tend to be located near people or near nature. You locate the installations where there is the most amount of resources available. That is going to be the main driver. And also we want to ensure that they are relatively close to the connection of the network because otherwise the cabling is going to be very expensive but also because you lose a lot of electricity if you transport the cable or the electricity through long distances. And because of that, there's gonna be a resistance. Why? Basically because you obstruct the view. My, my view is not as nice as it used to be and it generates noise. This is mainly the main issues when it comes to wind energy. But if you think a little bit other kinds of technology, like for example, solar panels, solar panels also carry resistance because they occupy space that tends to be used for agriculture, for example. And this is an example of things that happen in Germany. Community benefits, what they try to do is that they try to address this because they try to give away something back to the hosting citizens that they're giving, they're, they're being, in which the installation is going to be located. And because of all these issues of like, not in my backyard and the resistance, people tend or systems them to try to bring about some kind of compensation. And that kind of compensation is what is a community benefit. So if you ask me, a community benefit is some kind of retribution that a project developer and or sometimes the state gives back to a host community. And a host community will be that one in which the project is being developed or the one that lives nearby and it has a utilitarian process, a purpose of mitigating the negative impact of uh, energy renewable project. It will be externalities. So we are trying to create a way to address the externalities that are generated by the construction of a renewable energy facility. And these community benefits are often associated with the idea of distributive justice. So I give you something back to those that are affected. In, in that sense, we know that developing renewable energy in principle brings about benefits to the communities, but society in general, because we get cleaner production of energy, we get the possibility of creating jobs, and this generates economic activity. But the community benefits give something back to specific people. And that is a big difference, and that, that is why it's part of this idea of distributed justice. And in a way, they also give a voice to the communities because you, by ensuring that they're gonna be something given back to them, you at least take them into account in the process of conducting the, 
the licensing system and they get to have a chance to be heard or at least compensated, which is a, a way of looking at it. Some authors, uh, for example, see it as a bribe on the other hand, because they say, well, I give you tit for tat. And yes, that is actually the case. You give tit for tat to minimize the resistance. Whether it is a bribe, I think that's probably not the case. I just think it's being a bit less sarcastic or cynical, I think it's just a way to pay back a compensation that you get for an externality that is generated. So there's different ways of looking at the concept of community benefits and I have not mentioned it before, but I'll do it now. This presentation is connected to a paper that I'm writing and it's almost finished on community benefits. And I try to discuss what is a community benefit from a legal perspective. And as I mentioned before, when, whenever we build energy infrastructure, we generate economic activity and we promote more energy into the system, clean energy, reduction of CO2. So these are benefits that are granted because of the new construction of the new energy production to the country or society as a whole. But that is not enough to define a community benefit. A community benefit, in my opinion, needs to have a narrower perception. And a community benefit will be granted to a hosting community. This is a specific group of people that are defined based on typically their location in a territory in comparison to where the, the energy development facility is constructed. So how far you live from them, how far you generate your activity. And because of that, they are a host. So they are really connected to it. At the same time, this more narrow perception, in my opinion, tends not to include compensation payments. Sometimes when you build a, a wind farm, you will pay a compensation because of loss of value of a house, for example. And that is a direct compensation to a specific person, it's not to a community. It's a specific individual, or for example, whenever you're going to build a wind farm or a solar panel, and you need to expropriate a piece of land, that will be a particular compensation. So that is not really a community benefit because it does not give an advantage to the whole of the people that live in the area. And that is the, tri the kind of concept that I'm going to be discussing the most. So one of the aspects that I try to discuss is who is actually a beneficiary? Who is someone that receives a community benefit? And I did an analysis of jurisdictions mostly in the North Sea. So I looked at England, Scotland, Denmark, Germany, Norway, and the Netherlands, but I also included to some extent the US. Most states or most countries will tend to define who is a beneficiary based on a geographical criteria. How close are you are to the wind farm or the turbine or the solar panel? And for example, in Denmark, this is based on kilometers. They say you get a benefit if you live 16 kilometers from a large wind farm or 4.5 if you live closer to a, a smaller one or depends on the kind of benefit that you get. Also, you can, instead of using distance, you could say I use an administrative or jurisdictional criteria. Now, this commune in particular is going to get the benefit and this is going to be defined. Of course, that commune is chosen because it's relatively close to a specific area, but it's not discriminating on based on the kilometers that are you're located, it's discriminating based on you belong as a citizen to that commune. Um, but also, systems include other users that are not necessarily people that live in the vicinity. And we have the example of Norway that is very concerned about fisheries, uh, some entities that can get into problems or should get some kind of compensation because of energy activity. So one of the things that I also started thinking when I was writing this is whether do we need to give something back to a community when it comes to offshore wind? Because when we think about offshore wind, the first question is where are the farms located? So this is a picture taken from Peterhead that's in the outside of Aberdeen. And you can see the turbines. The turbines are maybe, I think it's about five or seven kilometers from shore. Uh, and they are relatively close, so you actually see them. But what about High Wind Tanten that is going to be located 150 kilometers from the shore of Norway? Can you see them? The answer is no. Uh, the literature in physics tells that you can see up to maybe 20, 30 kilometers 
in the distance, but no longer than that when it comes to an offshore wind turbine. And if you don't see them and you don't hear them, the question is, do you need to give a benefit back? And I'll give you the answer already. The answer is yes. Benefits are given regardless of the wind farms are located further off the shore. And the UK is a clear example of that. And I'll go through it a little bit later. So as I mentioned before, I go through a national and functional comparison. So this is more legal theory for the few of you that are interested in this kind of more boring stuff. But I've chosen some countries, which are the ones listed here. And I chose them because they have activity in offshore wind, but they also have some kind of regulation on community benefits. And what I try to do is I discuss a different kind of community benefits, not on a country by country basis, but I try to create categories of them. For example, payments, scholarships, um, modalities of ownership. And I try to discuss the different perceptions and approaches to this. And what it shows is that there are an interesting mix of different practices all over the world, or at least all over the North Sea. Countries don't copy each other, even though some of them are kind of repeated. And that is the case. So there's a lot of diversity here. And there's a lot of room for creativity too. And also it shows, as I mentioned before, that even if you have wind farms that are very located very far from the shore, community benefits are still being given. And the UK is a very clear example of this. It also shows that some systems and some kind of community benefits are more effective than others. And surprisingly, whenever it's not imposed by law, it seems to work best, which is the UK model. I was very surprised by that. Uh, the UK model, which is not mandatory, but is voluntary, works quite well. Whereas the Danish model that has created a rigid structure has been changed at least four times. And in 2020 has been changed twice. So this changed last time, 1st of June, 2020, after I had written my paper. So I had to go back and change quite a little bit of it. I was not happy about that. But let me tell you a little bit about this community benefits. And I have been speaking for 11 minutes. Um, so the first thing is that there are two big models and the two big models are voluntary schemes versus mandatory schemes. So the voluntary schemes are rather common and they are some way spearheaded by the UK. And in the UK, you have to distinguish between England and Scotland because England and Scotland have, have different ways of regulating wind activity. And also the Netherlands and the US include this kind of voluntary schemes. A voluntary scheme is, as the word says it, the companies and project developers decide whether they want to give a community benefit, what kind of community benefit they want to give and how much they want to give. But this is backed up by a good neighbor logic. If we want to address community resistance and we want to have citizens not complaining because we're building a wind farm in their vicinity, we want to be a good neighbor and we want to give something back to them. So if I am a responsible and good neighbor company, I will give some retribution to these people because I want to develop my project. And if they don't give me their support, my project is gonna be controversial or is not gonna even move forward. So this good neighbor logic is a tit for tat and it's, it, it works. However, what I've seen is that both in the UK in Scotland and the Netherlands, there's some kind of good practices that are enacted by governments. So this is not law, but there are more recommendations and they tell you, well, if you're gonna do a wind farm, then you should think about this kind of community benefits, you should include the population and so on and so forth. Because they are not set in stone, it means that they're not in law, they're rather flexible. They can evolve over time. And very importantly, they're tailor-made to each project and community because it does not distinguish on whether it's floating or fixed farm, or if it's close or if it's far, or how big it is or how small it is. So it gives a lot of flexibility when it comes to this. But then we also have mandatory schemes. And mandatory schemes are the law tells you, you need to do this specific kind of benefit to the communities. And the clear example is Denmark. That it will be the most highlightable one. And Denmark started in 2008 and reformed its system of energy and created a law to promote renewable energy that entered into force in 2009. And it had different systems to give something back to the hosting communities. And in the law, it stated what kind of benefit they should get and depending on where they were located. On the one hand, it's good because it's predictable. So companies know exactly what they have to pay, but it's rigid and sometimes in post. Because it is rigid, there's little tailoring about it. 
and can be not very effective. And I'll mention a little bit of that. And for that, for me as a lawyer, was a little bit of a surprise. You would think that if it's mandatory, it's more effective or, or it works best, but it, it happens that we don't really know in this industry and we don't really know how to regulate this and therefore flexibility seems to be working better. So let me give you some examples here and, and try to bring this more concretely. So there are different ways in which you can get a, give a community benefit as a project developer. The most common is creating a community fund or giving some one-time payment. So a community fund will be, I am a project developer, I'm Equinor, I'm building uh, a project just outside of the coast of uh, Veslan, and I will decide to create a fund in which I will put 5 million kroner every year, and it will go to a pot that is gonna be used by the people living in the vicinity. This kind of payments of community funds are very much used. And they tend to be typical, but not exclusively of voluntary systems. And they are often developed, often carried out by the developer. But in Denmark, for example, it is the state, the one that pays to this kind of funds. And that is quite interesting. So the government is the one that is spending money on behalf of the companies. But we have seen that this has changed quite a bit. This community pay payments and funds tend to be linked to the size or the capacity of the project. And they usually are linking megawatts with an amount of money that you're gonna pay. So for example, I have here the East Coast Community Fund that it's located in Yorkshire. So that's in the Northern, Northern England by Erste that is gonna pay about half a million pounds per year for 20 years to the coastal areas of Hornsea that are located in the vicinity of this wind farm that, mind you, is 60 kilometers offshore. You cannot see it, but the community benefits are there, okay? Um, One-time payments are also interesting and you see them in voluntary and mandatory mechanisms. And we have, for example, this Danish system of a green scheme. And this is what I meant about the government is the one paying. And Denmark decided not only on top of giving a, a payment to the electricity for the generators of electricity, we also will pay to the hosting community an extra fee. So the government of Denmark will pay to people living in the vicinity of wind farms, but also of solar panels, this amount 0 0.004 Danish crowns per kilowatt hour of electricity that is generated. And this was a scheme that was for 10 years to try to generate acceptance among people. So they would not oppose projects in their vicinity. And it has been phased out in February, 2020. And this was state aid for those that are interested in the more legal bits. Um, in the UK, interestingly, there's also payments that are received through the leasing of the seabed of the crown. So where the wind farms are gonna be located in the water, this money it's paid to the crown state so the the queen in a way and that is paid back to the communities and that's the case of scotland so they the money that they get for the leasing of the of the seabed it's then later on giving to people quite interesting another example of community benefit which raised quite a lot of expectations and it's, it's kind of sexy but it has been removed in june, june 2020 it's community ownership and this is a, a policy that Denmark had until this year, so three months ago, in which the law said that project developers had to allow people living in the vicinity to acquire up to 20% of the shares of a wind farm or a solar panel project. When I started looking into this and started to peep, started talking to people, most of the different stakeholders and people involved in energy thought that the system in Denmark meant that automatically 20% was in the hand of the community. No, what this project or this system did is that you as a private person could buy shares of the company. But of course this, this did not work because that's basically giving private capital to a project that you want to participate as if you were a normal investor. And why someone that lives in the vicinity that has to hear the noise and has to look at the turbines is going to buy shares and give some kind of financing to someone that is building. So it didn't really work. And the numbers in Denmark show that there was very little participation. And because of that, it, re it was removed. So this requirement of 20% was eliminated. 
But I also have examples of this kind of activity and ownership, uh, community ownership in the Netherlands. So for example, in the Netherlands, this is um, the wind park of Nust or Polder, which is in the north of Denmark, of the Netherlands. The community owns a percentage of the wind farm. But this wind farm has evolved. So it began first as an onshore wind farm. And my understanding now is that they have a far shore offshore wind park much bigger and the community ownership is only on the portion that is located close to the shore. This I discovered yesterday actually when I was looking for a little bit of examples here. But also in Germany, municipalities own offshore wind farms and they own it because the municipality has decided to invest heavily here. So that is another example of some kind of voluntary community ownership. Uh, last, I want to talk about other compensations to other users that are not people living in the vicinity. And the question is, are this community benefits? And let me give you the example of Norway. Norway in the Offshore Energy Act contains in paragraph nine, a provision in which the project developers have to pay a compensation to fishermen because of loss in, lost income when it comes to activity due to the installation of offshore wind farms. Norway does not have in its legislation anything about community benefits for people living in the vicinity of a wind farm, but it does include something for fishermen. And that is a little bit surprising, but if you think about it, Norway has 11% of all its exports are fish. So it's a very, very big lobby group. It's the second largest export in the country. And they are quite vocal. And I was thinking, well, they are asking for this. Is this really a community benefit? or this some more kind of loose thing because they are not really people living in the vicinity, but they are users of the sea. And then I started looking and I found that Norway is not the only example. In the UK, Erste has donated 300,000 pounds to a fisheries farm fund to avoid clashes and to also support um, fisheries in the sense that they have realized that indeed, this causes a loss to their activity and therefore they're in a way damage or suffer an impact because of the activity of the wind farm. And to try to avoid problems, they come up with this kind of solutions. So I am 22 minutes mark and I have one slide. That means that I'm doing great with time. So some conclusions, I want to give you some final ideas. What I've seen is that in offshore wind, there's a varied landscape. Community benefits exist and community benefits have become integrated in parts of the world where we have offshore wind activity. And they exist even though the turbines are becoming much bigger and much larger and also importantly, further away from the shore. So it doesn't really matter if you see them or not, the community benefits are here and the UK is a clear example of that. And I think that it's because people have realized that this have an impact and they want to get some kind of compensation back from it and they want to be heard. And because of that, even if I don't see them, they still will have some kind of, they condition the activity that they carry out. And also because you want to give something of kind of ownership or energy justice to people living in the vicinity. And also because I think that as community benefits and the giving of them has become widespread, people now expect to get a community benefit whenever there is a development of offshore activity anywhere where it's placed. Uh, we see that there are two types of community benefits in a large way. We see those that are mandatory and we see those that are voluntary. The voluntary schemes seem to work quite well, whereas the more rigid model, which is the Danish one, has changed and changed and changed over time. So it tells us that maybe having something freer based on soft law works better. And one of the last bits that I was thinking while finishing my paper was, well, do we only think about community benefits because of the turbines or we have to think a little bit further and more broadly? And I think this is again connecting to the fact that even though the turbines are far away from the shore, we still give something back to, to the communities. It's because we all have out building onshore installations. So we can have an offshore wind farm far away, but we need to have a sub power station and we need to have the network around. And because of that, we still see 
some kind of community benefits being given, but this is not being much discussed in the literature and much less in the legislation. What to do with the onshore installations of offshore energy activity. So with that, I've spoken 24 minutes, 44 seconds. And I would like to say, tak for my. This is all I have to say for now. Look forward to comments, questions, discussions, and so forth. Thank you very much.